Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. You know, in life they tell you, be careful what you wish for. In boxing you have three fighters who might be asking for a bit too much. Let's go through it one by one. If you disagree with me on any of these three fights, possible fights, then I hope you leave your comments for us in the comment section to this video. Okay, if you make a video on any of the fights, then I hope you leave a link to your video in the comment section to this video. First, Carl Froch was running off at the mouth. It's a little astonishing since Carl, of course, decided not to defend one of his belts against James DeGale, right? So Carl vacated a belt. So Carl then started saying that it would be a great day if he were able to fight Bernard Hopkins in Nottingham, his backyard. Bernard responded. Bernard was open to the idea. Then, of course, Carl started doing one of these. Dup, 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 right? Started backtracking. Right? Didn't want to talk about it too much further. Said, hey, that fight would be a no win for me. He's an old man. As if he wasn't an old man when Carl made his initial comments. But after Bernard was ready to accept, of course, now suddenly, Bernard's age became an issue. Carl said he's an old man. People expect me to beat him, right? If I beat him, I beat an old man. If I lose to him, I lose some legacy, right? Now, Bernard responded by saying, whoa, wait a moment. You know, I'm not chopped liver, right? Aren't you better off losing to a great fighter like me than losing to somebody else, right? The argument is, as, Car as Bernard eloquently put it, did Oscar De La Hoya lose his legacy fighting me? Did Felix Trinidad lose his legacy fighting me, right? Now, let me just say this. Bernard's coming off the worst fight I've ever seen him in, right? Maybe along the way there's a fight I missed. I'll agree he had some other tough fights, Bernard, I remember that Segundo Mercado fight where you hit the canvas. I believe you were in Ecuador or someplace, right? He's had some other tough fights. But that 12th round against Sergei Kovalev was really bad, right? You know, it was one of those times where you actually felt sorry for Bernard Hopkins. Because keep in mind, going into the 12th round, you knew Kovalev had already won the fight. Right, The only suspense in that 12th round was whether Bernard would be able to last the three minutes. And let's just say Bernard is lucky there wasn't a fourth minute in that 12th round. Right, He looked bad. Now if you go by CompuBox numbers, and I like to look at CompuBox numbers, Bernard's volume has been down for a while. Right, If Bernard is fighting a champion in that champion's backyard, a champ who has a very good jab, and that's Carl Froch. Keep in mind, the jab's enough to keep guys busy. The jab's enough to win slow rounds, right? If, you know, Bernard comes in with very low volume, and Carl Froch is able to come in and stick a jab, and if Bernard looks like he looked in the Kovalev fight, then Bernard could lose that fight by several rounds, right? Keep in mind, too, go back through Bernard's history. Against Jermaine Taylor twice, Bernard had a problem with his jab, right? Cobra might not even have to open the tool shed, right? He might be able to stick a jab out there, move a little bit, and say, Carl, I'm the champ, you're in my kingdom, Unless you can win rounds with me sticking this jab in your face, I'm going to stick this jab in your face for 12 rounds and win a wide decision. But there's another possibility. Understand that Bernard Hopkins really is like the New England Patriots, isn't he? You know, Hopkins really is like Bill Belichick, isn't he? 
You see the Bernard Hopkins who fought Winky Wright, that's different than the Bernard Hopkins who fought Antonio Tarver, right? That's different than the Bernard Hopkins who fought Joe Calzaghe, right? Who's different than the Bernard Hopkins who fought Kelly Pavlik, right? Bernard in some fights, notably the Pavlik fight. And understand, Pavlik not only was a big hitter, but had a great jab, right? Pavlik looked stationary compared to Bernard Hopkins, didn't he? Isn't Bernard the kind of guy who tailors his game to his opponent? How do we know Bernard Hopkins is not going to come in like he did against Kelly Pavlik, find a way not to get hit by the jab, right? Move around. Plan his entry points, right? Let me say this, too. You know, Carl's an excellent fighter, but I would say he's not the athlete, which is a little bit different, right? He's not the athlete Babel Chumanoff is or Sergei Kovalev is, right? I think those guys, just my own take, are better athletes than Carl Frotch. I find Carl to be a little bit slower than both guys. So there's certain things that Bernard couldn't do against those other guys that he might be able to do against Carl Frotch. So let's just say, Carl asked for the Bernard fight. Be careful what you ask for. Right? Hopkins was ready to take the fight. We're now getting backtracking from the Frotch group. Right? Just food for thought. Let's talk about a couple other possible fights. Amir Khan has really been full of himself in some interviews, hasn't he? If you believe Amir Khan, there's not a person within a few weight classes of him who can hang in the ring with him, right? He believes, and I'll give young guys credit on aiming high, right? He believes that he beats Floyd Mayweather. I think, by the way, my own take, is that that's the toughest fight for Mayweather within Mayweather's class, right? You know, 147, 154, I think Amir Khan is difficult for Floyd Mayweather. But Khan also has been going around bad-mouthing Kell Brook. Now, maybe, maybe that Kell Brook machete injury is so bad that Khan realizes Tom, Dick, and Harry can beat Kell Brook right now, right? We're going to find out a lot in Kell Brook's next fight. But if you believe Khan, you know, he got the better of Kell Brook when they sparred. He got the better of Manny Pacquiao when they sparred, right? Now, Khan's really lost it. Khan is talking about gaining weight to get to 155 to take on Miguel Cotto. Now, let me say this, right? Fighters, especially when they're in their later 20s, need to realize that if you move to 155 from 147 after having been at 140 for a long time, that's not just a weight gain for a fight. That's a lifestyle change, right? As you get older, Roy Jones found this out when he went to heavyweight. You get older and you say, okay, let me just go up a weight class. Good luck losing that weight to get back to 147. What Amir Khan needs to think about before he challenges anyone at 155 is whether he's prepared to stay at 155. Right? You gain the weight. Your body accepts that weight. You fight at that weight. You're going to have a hard time losing it later. That's the first thing. The second thing is people need to realize this Miguel Cotto is not the Miguel Cotto who fought Austin Trout. I can tell you I was at Hooters in Campbell. I was sitting next to a sports fan, right, a boxing fan, and he was talking up Miguel Cotto before the Cotto-Martinez fight. And I was listening to him, and I thought, okay, you know, this is interesting. Um, I thought, you know, uh, you know, I watch makeovers on these housing shows where they come in and remodel the house. But I thought, how are you really going to remodel a fighter in his 30s? And I have to tell you, I was watching that, you know, Martinez fight. I was stunned. Cotto was moving so well. He looked so good. 
right? You know, height's a funny thing. Sometimes you see tall guys, right? Especially guys with jabs. Let's say Vladimir Klitschko, right? Um, Deontay Wilder. You notice that tall guys sometimes have an advantage because they're taller. But understand, there's a flip side. There's a whole part of boxing, right? The Sam Langford, Joe Fraser, Rocky Marciano side of boxing. Dwight Cowie side of boxing, right? Guys who are shorter sometimes have advantages, especially when the other guy doesn't have a way to keep the smaller guy off of him. Somebody tell me why a Miguel Cotto, Amir Khan fight, wouldn't be like Ali Fraser won, right? Understand, Ali Fraser 2, I know Ali wins it, but that's really an illegal fight, isn't it? Because Ali hugged Fraser to death in that fight and pushed down the back of his neck. Refs won't allow that today. They shouldn't have allowed it then. The first fight, Joe Fraser comes in, right? The argument is that Ali was rusty, right? Ali had just fought, I think, once or twice after he came back from an exile. Well, anyway... Joe Fraser comes in, like Miguel Cotto, he's throwing hellacious left hooks. Eventually, he decks Ali, right? Ali didn't have anything to keep him off of him. Fraser smothered the hand speed. Why does Khan think he can gain weight against a guy who has the belt at 160 and actually be competitive with Miguel Cotto at 155? Right? Understand, boxing's not rock, paper, scissors. I know Mayweather beat Miguel Cotto. Okay, fair enough. But that doesn't mean I can't also think that Khan gives Mayweather a hard time, but Miguel Cotto walks through him at 155. Let's talk about one more fight. I consider Big Daddy Lucas Brown to be one of the best athletes in the heavyweight division. Right? This guy used to be a kickboxer. This guy has great feet. Now, another former kickboxer, Alexander Ustinov, right, has called out Big Daddy. Good luck with that. Ustinov has a great right hand, no question about it. But Ustinov's left, in my opinion, is underdeveloped. He doesn't really have a great jab. Go through the Big Daddy resume. You're going to notice that he beat James Tony. Now, I'm not saying the James Tony he beat is prime James Tony, but what I am saying is if you're a one handed fighter against Lucas Brown, I don't think you have a chance. Right? So, this is one of those situations where some guy is calling out another guy who I think, if he accepts the fight, beats him up. Right? So. Pay close attention to that. Understand, the heavyweight division is multi-layered. I personally feel that Deontay Wilder is a very vulnerable champion. Very vulnerable. Right? You need to look at Lucas Brown. You need to look at Alexander Ustinov. You need to continue to look at Adlanir Solis. Right? At Kubrat Pulev. Because I'm telling you, these guys have much more experience, in my opinion, against much tougher competition than does Deontay Wilder, right? I think Lucas Brown beats Alexander Ustinov if he accepts that fight. Keep an eye on that situation, right? To sum up, hey, we all get full of ourselves, right? I've made some calls here online where I've had to make post-fight videos with egg on my face, including... Cotto's victory over Sergio Martinez. Let's just say I'm not alone in, you know, being too full of myself. Some of these fighters, right, Carl Frotch, Amir Khan, Alexander Ustinov, right now are running off a bit too much at the mouth. And in boxing, sometimes guys will call your bluff. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. If you see any of these fights differently, 
I hope you tell us about it in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.